Thank you very much, General Miller. So in order to give you all a few minutes to think of those tough, incisive questions, I'm going to uh, ask our panelists a couple of questions to get the conversation start, uh, started. Um, starting with the EU perspective, um, I, you know, the strategy that's guided the CSDP um, was written in a, in a different period. And as the security environment continues to evolve, as the fiscal constraints continue to get tighter, do you see any change in either how the EU defines its mission set or its level of ambition going forward? Thank you for, for a very interesting question, uh, which uh, uh, I will try to answer to, but which will probably be answered at, at the end of the year by the heads of states and government uh, when they meet uh, in Brussels for, for an EU council. Uh, from my perspective, I, I would highlight a few, few of them. One of the threats we're facing in Europe is uh, the progressive downsizing of the awareness of defense and security issues. Mm -hmm. And so there is, uh, not by the polit politicians, not by the decision makers, but by the overall population. Mm -hmm. The awareness uh, of the, collectively, of the 27 nations of the issues at stake uh, uh, needs to be addressed. Uh, this is why uh, some type of a white book, uh, green paper, uh, in the coming years, uh, with a very large uh, buy-in by the uh, general public, uh, would be, uh, in my views, very useful. Uh, there is the need also to explain what militaries are for, and there we have uh, an opportunity with the Solidarity Clause that uh, is in the Lisbon Treaty, which highlights uh, the fact that uh, facing very uh, intense, uh, like uh, Fukushima events, uh, it was in Europe, uh, we could uh, uh, help collectively uh, the other nations. Uh, and so this is for the buy-in internally. Externally, uh, it is uh, to deal with our close neighborhood. Uh, this is so, so as, yet again, to go in what I said initially, which is to have a buy-in by the, by the public. Uh, the public doesn't, in Europe, the, some, most of them, don't really uh, understand the, the aim and the focus of uh, engagements in Afghanistan or, or even in, uh, in, in Mali in the Sahel region. So the, the immediate uh, um, proximity uh, of the of Europe uh, needs to be uh, addressed as well. Uh, and there, there are things that are being done. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, there are some practical uh, uh, conclusions to this, but uh, that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, a question for both of you, maybe starting with General Miller this time, is, um, again, given that we have so many shared interests, we're going to, in many situations, whether it's the ones you've named in Africa or mm -hmm. others in the future, we're gonna find ourselves with common objectives working side by side. The whole question in, in, a, in a budget constraint environment, how do we get more capability out of our investment uh, in, in, for the future? Um, and specifically, are there, sh are there ways that the US and the EU can have a closer, whether it's just a comparing of notes, whether it's collab actual collaboration, actual working towards synergy. Are there ways that, w should we be doing more together on the whole area of cap our own capability development for the future? Yes, I, th I think, as, as we stated, the fiscal environments and the, the operational uh, terrain out there just drives us to more collaboration. From, across all domains, military and civilian domains. Um, joint is a way to look at this. Um, and I think uh, we can start with uh, a look at the processes and the issues that um, would be easy or, as you stated, are common to both being cyber, um, ISR being, being that uh, capability that both of, those, uh, both of those areas and those domains are going to be with us uh, and are going to have more and more outside uh, agents in those domains. So the more we can work together to understand that domain and defend and, uh, and work together on those, uh, I, I think that's a good place to start. So not only the, 
that would be the primary focus that would just make sense right off the mm -hmm. bat between between those capabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's it's complicated, in fact, uh, of course, to find areas where we can, on capability, uh, exchange completely. Uh, mm -hmm. But there is a virtue to first have a good knowledge and share knowledge of what are the issues, what are the threats and challenges, mm -hmm. and how do we plan to address them. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if I just take one of them, cyber, uh, it's typically the area where collectively it's hard to deal with it completely because it's so uh, sensitive mm -hmm. uh, uh, that it's bilateral relationship can take place. But yet, there are some avenues which can be followed mm -hmm. just on that topic, uh, which is uh, shared awareness of the issue, shared awareness of how we can transfer that awareness to uh, shared knowledge of how we can transfer that awareness to the public, best practices. Mm -hmm. uh, so that there, there are areas like this. And then uh, there are areas where, through training, we can also have uh, that interoperability between all of us. Mm -hmm. OK, good. So I've given you a few minutes to think of your questions, so I expect many hands to shoot up in the air now. To uh, The floor is open to ask questions. As, you, as I call on you, if you could please, or do you want people to come to the microphone, or you're going to pass the microphone around? Okay, so a microphone will be brought to you. Please let us know who you are and where you're from, uh, what your organization is, and then ask your question. The floor is open. Yes, sir, in the back. Hi, I'm, I'm Daniel Gage. I'm with the State Department. Um, I wanted to ask you a question I asked earlier today, and, and I think that you folks are, are, are probably better placed to answer it. Um, you mentioned that there are uh, ongoing consultations between UCOM and the EU military staff and so forth. How do you, General Miller, uh, plan for a mission not knowing if CSDP contributing nations will provide certain resources? And, and General Duruzier, how do you plan for the mission from your side, not knowing what you can bring to the table? What, uh, uh, sorry, do you want? No. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, what do we plan to do? We are operating in the same areas operating sometimes side by side completely, like it is the case for the training mission uh, that G General Lahan uh, is uh, leading, which is the training mission in Somalia, where there is close day-to-day -day collaboration between the, the US and, and us. Uh, what, so this exists already, but we obviously know that we are going to operate in, in other areas. And we have the, the need to explain the whole range of what, we, what EU brings, because it's not only the military, it's a whole global uh, capacity to engage. If you look at what happened in the Horn of Africa, uh, it's not at all a, a fight against piracy exclusively. It is a fight against piracy, but it's done with all the various elements, development, humanitarian aid, uh, political dialogue, <laughs> Uh, uh, bringing in regional ownership and discussions, uh, political discussions uh, between the EU and, and other states. It's helping some of those states to build up their judicial uh, cap capacity. So <coughs> I, I won't go into more detail because I imagine most people here know about this. But this just shows that when we, when the EUMS uh, discuss with uh, AFRICOM, they bring all of this, which is uh, not only the military aspects, uh, for which, of course, as we are an organization which uh, depends completely on what the member states will provide, <coughs> we do not know uh, next time what we will have to provide, but we have a diversity which can help uh, AFRICOM see, uh, and, and the US as a whole, uh, what type of uh, help can be provided. Okay. You want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, just to say <coughs> that... Uh, you know, with any operation that the United States uh, is is working, we, the President uh, and the Secretary of Defense, will look to other partners to contribute. Um, I think, given the fiscal environment, I think uh, 
and, and we've learned that to go at something on our own is really not um, probably given, uh, it, it's just really not the right way ahead in today's environment, being so complex. So we will always look to our other partners to try to collaborate and see what, what, is, what country is best to bring that, the right capabilities and capacities to bear given the situation, so. Fran. Fran Burwell from the Atlantic Council. Um, I wanted to ask what was the role of NATO in all this? Uh, personally, I'm thrilled to hear about greater EU-US cooperation. I think we should be talking more and doing more together. I'm thrilled that the, we've now got this agreement that allows the US uh, personnel to participate in EU operations. But do both of you have, in your mind, when you're thinking about an operation and what it might evolve into, times when you say, this should be something where NATO is very much involved. General Miller, are you, is that your automatic assumption? Um, and then something like the EU would be an add-on, uh, even though there are many of the same countries. And General Rusi, obviously you're the head of the EU military committee, so that will be your first impulse. But are there times when you look at an operation and say, we need to be talking with NATO from the very beginning? How do we reconcile this? Thank you. Um, with, within my office and partnership strategy, uh, for, the, for the chairman, we, uh, I have a division called Coalition Affairs Division. And for example, for Libya, when Libya um, was coming about and the situation was developing, uh, within my office, we basically ran the Coalition Affairs um, interagency. We, we kept the matrix, so we would literally uh, get with the State Department and get with the Chairman and the Secretary of Defense and, and OSD policy and the members of the interagency. And we would keep track on uh, who was going to actually contribute in this operation, what they were going to contribute, and we kept the overall matrix. We didn't make the phone calls, but we kept it all. So you could see as the timeline went along, uh, each day the situation was, was different and consultations would happen and um, the request would go out for more participation from a certain country, and then they would look at the matrix and say, well, I think we, we might need to bring this other group in. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an optic that we're, uh, that we're very, uh, that we pay attention to, who's contributing. So it's, it's um, that just might give you a flavor of how we would do that. But NATO is absolutely a part of uh, any, any calculus that, uh, that's, that the Defense Department has regarding operations, so. For the reasons you highlighted, uh, 21 member states being uh, members of both an organization, uh, and so the, it's the, the nations, the ambassadors in Brussels, uh, it's the chief of defense, uh, they, they all uh, look at what is the situation and what is the best tool. I've only been in office for five months, uh, but I've, never seen any competition between EU and NATO uh, because it uh, wouldn't make sense, wouldn't be useful. Uh, there is, of course, questions, uh, and, but there are links. There are uh, exchanges at, uh, regularly, uh, uh, Lady Ashton and, and uh, uh, Mr. Rasmussen uh, meet very regularly uh, with uh, Match Popovsky and, and a few others from the External Action Service in order to look ahead uh, in all issues, one of which is, of course, our, uh, potential areas of operations. Uh, between the chairman of the uh, NATO Military Committee and myself, uh, we exchange very regularly also. The institution as such, the uh, uh, PS, uh, PSC and NAC, the ambassadors, and the uh, military committee also, EU and NATO, we have regular meetings, but for uh, political reasons, we are limited to what we discuss, but the discussions take place elsewhere. Uh, I think uh, another way to answer your question, so the answer is yes, this does take place, and there's no preemptive of one to another. Um, the other way of answering your question is to say that uh, NATO and EU are different, profoundly different. Uh, 
both by the member states that are, are in it, both by the military capabilities, because nowhere in Europe do we, as any nation, or do we have collectively some of the military uh, capabilities that you have in the US, or the diplomatic uh, or the economic uh, uh, environment that you have. So that, that also could trigger uh, going to, to NATO instead of going to the EU. Uh, but there are also areas where uh, EU is, more, uh, is, is better suited to tackle. Georgia being one very example, very uh, easy example, uh, and there might be uh, others in, in the future. So I think it will be, for me, heads of states who will decide on a case by case each time. And where the progress can be made is to, which is very difficult, is uh, for the prudent planning uh, that takes place uh, wherever, in states or in institutions, to have some type of uh, awareness. Uh, and, and this is where intelligence sharing, to the extent that it's possible, is very important. Uh, because, of course, intelligence sharing is mainly done bilaterally, but there is also an awareness. I happen to be in NATO for some while, so both in NATO and in the EU, it's needed so that uh, all the member states, the 28 or 27, soon 28, member states understand uh, the events. Just to highlight, uh, during the Mali operation, I happened to be uh, in, in Brussels in, in office at that time. The awareness by the, despite all of what was done, uh, the uh, Sahel strategy, the military awareness of the state of play of uh, Al-Qaeda and the sur surrounding in, in the other state was not that high in some member states, which is normal because that just means that the pipes were not open. Uh, by those who had the information, and this was open to more. So any exchange of, of situation uh, would, is useful. If I could just add um, on to this question about EU and NATO collaboration, again, taking us to the realm of capability development for the future at a time when we all face fiscal constraints. It, with the challenge is to ensure that the, the, the whole the outcome of the investment is greater than the sum of the parts, not less. Are you satisfied with the quality and degree of cooperation between EU and NATO on capability development? Say, the conversation, whether it's a conversation between ACT and EDA or between the other mm -hmm. um, powers involved. Are you, do you think there's more needs to be done there as we enter into a more constrained budgetary period? Uh, I think the trend is very positive. Four years ago, I happened to be in Brussels and discussions between uh, ACT and EDA or EU bodies was extremely limited if it didn't exist, in fact, nearly. nearly. Uh, and, and now it's much more open to the extent that, uh, that uh, SACT uh, uh, came to the European Defence Agency uh, seminar in, in Brussels uh, a month ago. So there are signs like this which show that uh, there is uh, positive trends. Uh, another sign is what is, but that's more important, is what is done on, on the ground uh, with uh, what is happening with the um, counter IED labor laboratory, which is uh, in place in Afghanistan, which is funded uh, uh, by the European Defense Agency, so by EU states uh, and France and Spain and a few others. Uh, and which is in Afghanistan, uh, of mm -hmm. course, uh, helping ISAF and so helping mm -hmm. NATO. So there are signs that the cooperation does take place. Uh, and there is also, I think, now the very good understanding, both by NATO and by EU, that it's, main, it's, it's also mainly now through clusters, regional clusters, uh, cooperation of three, two, four, five member states uh, getting together uh, not only uh, making same uh, staff requirements, which is first important, but also sometimes deciding to operate commonly, mm -hmm. which will mean that in the long term, uh, in a decade or two decades from the acquisition, they will still be able to have a synergy between, mm -hmm. uh, between everyone. Mm -hmm. Good. Yes, you had a question. <clears throat> My name is Rafał Domisiewicz and I'm with the uh, US and Canada division at the European External Action Service. 
Um, one of the work strands uh, which General De Rosier proposed uh, for EU-US cooperation concerns environmental and ener energy impacts. Um, this is an issue that uh, you know, we in the European Union devote much attention to, the impact of climate change. And so a question for General Miller, uh, how much of uh, an attention uh, is devoted uh, uh, within the Joint Chiefs uh, to, uh, to, to these issues? Thank you. Within the services, um, there's a, a very aggressive um, campaign and energy put behind uh, the saving of energy, particularly, for example, the Air Force uh, is the biggest consumer of fuel within Department of Defense. So with each one of the services, we've each got our challenges with, uh, with energy, and the Navy is leading the charge on alternate sources of energy and alternate sources of fuel. So there's a lot of benchmark work being done uh, within each of the different services across all spectrums of energy uh, and energy savings and synthetic fuels. Uh, so uh, it's, it's very aggressive work. Um, the chairman that's, uh, other than uh, monitoring the progress and working with uh, the programmers, uh, the, the community of programmers to ensure that if we have markers out there for uh, efficiencies uh, that we meet those. Other than that, most of that work is accomplished within the services, you know, directed from uh, different levels within the Defense Department, but conducted by the services in there. Uh, it really is uh, cost savings, and there's a lot of uh, work done out in the 20 and 25 year um, realm in that arena. So it's, it's really pretty aggressive work being done. Yes, sir. Yes, Ken Chastain from Army G2. I'd like to bring up a bit of a sensitive subject here. Unfortunately, the U.S. rebalance to Asia and the downsizing of our forces in Europe is perceived by some commentators as dis U.S. disengagement from Europe. Have you seen any impact on EU, U.S., or NATO partnerships or relationships as a result of this rebalance? I will resist the temptation to, to uh, argue with the premise, but mm -hmm. go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't. I've heard the, more and more the opposite uh, in Europe, that, but I'm, I'm not from this side of the Atlantic, so, but uh, there is more and more voice saying there is a rebalance because there is, yes, a focus, which is uh, greater in Asia, but doesn't mean that the focus doesn't exist in Europe. And missile defense is, which has nothing to do with EU, uh, but uh, is uh, a highlight that there is still continuing engagement. Uh, it's just, yes, there are issues for each of the member states because, yes, they are units uh, from the US which are leaving Europe, which could be seen as a sign of disengagement. Uh, which in any case pose local issues. But apart from that, no, I, uh, I have not seen uh, any evidence of what you're highlighting uh, at all. I mean, it, but there is another issue. Uh, I think uh, it was um, the word leading from behind, which was used at one point. Whether it's relevant or not relevant, whether it was accurate or not, doesn't, isn't important uh, for us European. It highlighted the fact that, uh, uh, yes, we need to try to, to invest 2% of our GDP in defense. Uh, we anyhow need to try to find ways to be at the forefront. And the two operations, from my perspective, uh, that were conducted recently uh, in our vicinity, which is uh, Libya and Mali, highlighted that uh, the US were not leading from behind. Uh, but the U.S. were very supportive since the beginning. Uh, but it was up to us to sometimes make on our own, as Europeans, not EU, but to make our, our decision and our commitment. Uh, that was the case for France in Mali, uh, and, and it was the case for France, the U.K., and the U.S. in Libya. So it just, uh, I see, I think it's a very positive way because 
it also builds for us confidence. Yes, we can do things. We can do uh, initial entry force. We can go and we, we can't do it alone, uh, but it's uh, under a UN mandate, so it's normal that we don't do it alone. Uh, and this is a pretty positive effect. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Miguel Pereira da Silva. I'm the Portuguese representative here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. It's actually two questions in one. Um, the first is how do you see, and General Sir, you did mention. The, the effort of counter piracy as a way ahead in the transatlantic cooperation. How do you see the lessons learned or the experience drawn from the Horn of Africa playing a role in the Gulf of Guinea in the very nearby future? And the second one connected with this, but now, uh, ma'am, um, how does the United States, who despite being pivoting to, to Asia, are increasingly paying attention to Africa within defense and security, see the capabilities of European countries to, to be assets in the US effort in that, um, in that effort. Thank you. Uh, Gulf of Guinea isn't the Horn of Africa, and the Horn of Africa isn't Malacca. Uh, and I could continue on that. Yet they do have similarity, which is one of, which is the most important one for me. It's a regional, local ownership is the only way out, uh, because otherwise uh, you can put as many ships, helicopters, uh, um, uh, maritime patrol, reconnaissance aircraft uh, that you want, uh, you will not deal with the root cause. So you need to analyze what are the root cause. The root cause in the Horn of Africa are completely different from the ones in the Gulf of Guinea. Uh, yet there is an issue and a raising issue uh, in the Gulf of Guinea, which is more uh, within, in, within the states and within the very sh uh, close vicinity of, uh, of, so in territorial waters. I was trying to find my word. Um, so the issue is completely different and the way to tackle it is completely different. Uh, yet the EU, the External Action Service is starting to, not starting, has started a long time ago and is, is increasingly looking at what is the state of play, what is the situation, is there uh, uh, options for an EU engagement, through which means, because it could also be uh, just pure civilian uh, means, uh, and, and this then will come to the member states who will collectively uh, uh, raise their decisions and, and could implement something. So the, the main lessons that uh, I think we get from those uh, engagements is that uh, we, we need to raise the awareness uh, and to really understand what is the issue. And then we can engage. <laughs> and we have gained a lot of experience in Atalanta highlighting that uh, uh, some member states even say that uh, this sh should be an operation that could continue in other areas uh, apart from the Horn of Africa, uh, which is probably right, but we need to see, uh, see how and what is the commitment because there are many, many areas uh, because where this type of problem occurs because, in fact, what are we speaking about? It's about illegal trafficking and illegal trafficking through, uh, through the... Uh, sea lane of, uh, of communication is, is worldwide. And so we need to also know where, where do we go and, and to focus our limited assets uh, in areas where it's really, uh, really important. Yes, um, the United States, uh, of course, works very closely with many European nations in, in the continent of Africa um, to bring capability and capacity uh, to the very complex environment. Um, and we uh, hold a lot of exercises within uh, other European, uh, with other European countries within that realm. Um, so we collaborate uh, directly with them and, and use them, or actually work together with them uh, very closely on that continent. 
If you'll forgive me, I, I can't resist. I have to step out for just a minute out of the mode of moderator and comment on the there since the rebalance has come up a couple of times, and I was personally very engaged in the crafting of that policy. You know, the notion of rebalancing towards Asia really wasn't so much about shifting relative emphasis from Europe or Middle East or anywhere else to Asia as a zero-sum game. It was really out of the president's uh, thinking that as we come out of more than a decade of war, where we're the folk deeply focused on Iraq, Afghanistan, huge amount of senior leader attention, resources, energy, focus, and as, as we come out of those commitments, or they become much less, um, and what happens to that bandwidth? Where's the opportunity for the future? And the idea was to invest more of our strategic thinking and our resources in Asia, recognizing that the first place we go to to find partners and allies um, in the world is Europe, and the transatlantic relationship remains absolutely critical to US security, to transatlantic security. Um, and I think this relates to this leading from behind, which is an unfortunate phrase, but the notion of the model in Libya, which is a little different than Mali, but the notion that there are times when the best US contribution or the best form of US leadership is to enable others to step up and participate fully and take the lead where their interests demand that they do so, that's a good thing. You know, when you're a leader and you enable a, a whole team to be more effective, you don't have to necessarily be out front every time. If you can play an enabling role and enable, enable others to step up and lead, that's a great contribution to international security. So I, whatever, you, however, you know, whatever the negative connotations of some of the phrasing of leading from behind, I actually think what happened in Libya was a very positive thing mm -hmm. and something that we should uh, build on in the future in terms of the, the model. Leo. Uh, thanks. Leo Michel, National Defense University. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing General de Roussier for several years now. And I've been a great admirer of his work. And Same. I think it's, he brings something also unique uh, to the situation in that. And I believe, uh, General, you were the first uh, French representative to be dual habit to the EU and NATO. So you have a good understanding of NATO. And in the five points that you mentioned for greater bilateral US-EU contact, all of which I think are very serious and deserve consideration, but you probably understand from your NATO experience that uh, there can be sensitivities among the other NATO allies who are not members of the EU. So I, this isn't exactly a question, but maybe kind of a comment suggestion. It could be that so that some of the other allies don't develop sensitivities, the US is somehow going behind their back and doing things you know, that exclude them. Uh, and there are probably some allies who are a little bit schizophrenic about this as well, who are members of both organizations. Probably from the demand side, that is from the EU side, it's always good to give consideration to exactly what areas you want to discuss uh, and improve bilateral relations with the US in a way that would not be duplicative or uh, interfere in other ongoing arrangements within NATO. This depends very much on the region involved and, and I think maybe Africa is that region where you could have the best bilateral cooperation uh, that wouldn't in a way interfere with the other ongoing relations and strategic dialogue that we have within NATO. Mm -hmm. I, I, I fully agree uh, with this, uh, but I and I fully agree with uh, your your initial comment, uh, that, uh, and I take that point. Uh, Africa is uh, obviously an area where, for many years, we have been engaged and with uh, uh, in relation with the U.S. So, so it's a, a very good uh, area to continue, and this is what we're we're intending to, to do, and this is, uh, I understand, uh, the way the U.S. plans to do it, and uh, I will be meeting soon in Brussels the new African command commander. 
uh, for discussions and highlighting, uh, and that's on his request, uh, highlighting that there is a willingness uh, to, uh, to have this type of exchange with us. Uh, it was not new Newcom who came, uh, who will be coming, it's AFRICOM, so uh, I, I get very easily this sign. But I think in the future, uh, we, we will need to see, and this is post-December uh, post, uh, this year, after heads of states and government will, will give us uh, their views, collective views of where geographically the focus will be. And I cannot preempt what they will say. What I can, and it, this was highlighted this morning, uh, Lady Ashton went to China. Uh, uh, so we are moving also. The External Action Service is moving and is, uh, is uh, interacting with uh, different uh, nations. And for some of those, the defense aspect or security and defense aspect will be maybe limited or uh, in, uh, will not exist. Uh, but in others, it will. And, and this is where, uh, with the US, we we will need uh, to have discussions so that there is a mutual understanding of uh, uh, what are uh, the interests of the 27 uh, uh, and of the US. Well, unfortunately, we have run out of time, and we promise to uh, finish up on time. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for a very, very rich discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you once again for allowing us to work together to illustrate this global partnership that we try to continue working on. Um, I hope this seminar may be some fruits, and I hope we shall be in a position to try it again uh, next year. And uh, so have a good evening, and thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>